Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadine. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me once again. This is part two of Sex, Love, and Relationships with Dr. Renee Hilliard. Thank you, Dr. Renee, for being here again with us. Thank you for having me back, Amy. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. We got so much great feedback from last week's show. We had to cut it short and we didn't even get to talk about the five things that I wanted to talk about with you. So, you know, last week we talked about how to get your vagina stoned, about your program, Seriously Sexy. For those people who did not join us last week, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about Seriously Sexy and how, <laughs> why we're even talking about getting your vagina stoned. Yeah, so so I've been in the field of sexual medicine for over 20 years now as a gynecologist and, and I delivered babies for 18 years. But um, in the last couple of years, I've, I've developed a sex, love and relationship coaching program. I got, uh, um, certification from the Tantric Institute of Integrated Sexuality, and um, mainly to help my patients have better sex lives and have better relationships and deepen their connections and intimacy. Um, oh, I was yes. going to say, I think that's something that every single one of my patients would love to have. I mean, it's, it's very rare when I have a patient that says, oh my God, I get to have sex. And like every other day, oh, thank you, Dr. Amy, because that's basically what I tell people to do, how to have sex, not how, but when to have sex, how much sex to have. And it, it feels like work after a very short period of time. Yeah, for sure. A lot of um, my patients share with me that they um, feel like sex is more like a chore, like mm -hmm. it's like exercise, going to the gym. It's not pleasurable to them. Um, and sometimes it never was, but many times especially when they start going into fertility care, it can feel like there are a lot of demands right. and it doesn't feel very intimate or very sexy anymore. Um, right. There's right. nothing sexier than somebody holding an ovulation stick at you and yeah. wagging that <laughs> That's at true. you That's <laughs> in an angry tone and said, you have to have sex with me. That's not yeah. that sexy. Yeah. So. And last week we talked about the five things to consider when coping with the stress of fertility treatments. We went through, number one, self-care, how it's crucial. Number two, challenging your beliefs around the diagnosis. And then number three was acceptance. So talk to me about how you talk to your clients and patients about acceptance when it comes to this, you know, being a fertility patient. Right, yeah. So many times when we start down the road of fertility care, you know, the mind goes crazy and, and you start thinking about all the things I should have done differently. I shouldn't have waited this long. I shouldn't have stayed with that partner for five years that didn't work out with. And, you know, why didn't I take better care of myself when I was younger? Um, but, you know, those things we can't change. You know, the whole serenity prayer that a lot of people are familiar with, you know, essentially accept the things you can't change and change and change the things you can and know the difference between those two. So, in my opinion, the non-acceptance of things you can't change just adds more stress to the equation. So trying to differentiate between things I actually have control over and things I don't have any control over, like my age or you know whether my eggs are functioning the way that I'd like for them to be at 39 years old or whatever. Um, the first step is really acceptance and then finding out if there's something I can do, what, what shall I do to, to help optimize my chances mm -hmm. here. So. Well, you sang for us last week, and I'm not going to make mm -hmm. you sing, let, what is it, for the Frozen song, Let It Go. <laughs> but, you know, it's true. I mean, you got to say you did what was right for you in the moment and just let it go and move on and live your best life. So number four is stop feeding your stress. So how do you help your patients do that? Yeah. Well, a big one in our in our society is, is technology. So we're you know many of us are plugged in twenty four seven to technology, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of studies showing now that that really increases our stress level. It puts us in this perpetual flat, fight or flight mode, and, and advertisers and other um, entities are trying to get our attention at all times. Um, but the brain really doesn't know the difference between real stress and this contrived stress that comes from technology, and our cortisol levels, our stress hormone levels go up with using technology, you know, mm -hmm. incessantly like that. So one of the first things I, I encourage people to do is unplug from technology when you can. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of people, especially in our area that work in technology um, or, you know, have to be plugged into their 
phone 24 seven like you, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but whenever possible to try to limit that. Um, a lot of people go on Facebook and do this, this whole comparison thing, you know, oh, look at their families and oh, that person's not even a good person and they have children and, and, and it just doesn't help, you know, mm -hmm. so um, just, just learning to unplug when you can from, from those sorts of things. Negative news and, and you know, negative media really um, can put us in a negative, um, uh, put a negative filter on our on our perception of things. Mm -hmm. um, just as the, in the same way that watching a lot of violent television, they're showing it, it impacts kids and, and the way that they behave. Watching a lot of negative um, news and those kinds of things can really change your filter on the world where everything seems more depressing and, and during fertility treatment and care, is not not a time that you want to increase your your depression. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. And the fifth thing he mentioned is if in a partnership, strengthen your couple bubble. I mean, I really like that terminology. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't come up with the term. That's actually from Stan Tatkin. Um, there's a book called Wired for Love um, that talks about um, in a in a palatable way just the neuroscience um, behind. Um, relationship um, and, and coupled them. Um, but a lot of people let other people get in the middle of their relationship. You know, either they, they share a lot of things with friends or family. Um, and one couple, I mean, one partner in the couple may be a very private person, whereas the other one likes to talk everything out with their sister or their friend. Um, and that can really harm a relationship, especially, you know, if there are, are struggles within the relationship. Many times outsiders will take the side of whomever they're speaking to in the couple, you know, they mm -hmm. rarely take the other person's side. So a lot of times uh, one partner can feel ganged up on or, um, you know, it, it just doesn't doesn't do much to strengthen a partnership. So I um, try to get clients to see their their couple, you know, their, their partnership as a sacred entity where, mm -hmm. you know, they they develop better communication and intimacy within the couple and then they keep out outside influences the best they can. Um, you know, obviously, you know, things are challenging in families. You know, people have a lot to say, especially around holiday tables. Mm -hmm. People ha always have mm -hmm. input into, you know, things like fertility care and those kinds of things that are many times unwelcome. But but really having each other's back and, and you know, being able to, um, you know, see when your partner is going in distress mode and, and how to manage those things and giving them escape routes when when you're around your family, um, those kinds of things can really be helpful right. to, to strengthen couples. Well, along those lines of being around family, I mean, here we are holiday time and people mm. ask all sorts of intrusive questions, nosy neighbors, friends, relatives. How do you coach your patients and clients around the issues of people asking questions that you don't necessarily feel comfortable answering? Yeah, yeah, so a lot of times, um, even outside of holiday times, uh, other people, coworkers, friends, family, feel like they can comment on our reproductive lives and our fertility. Um, you know, they'll say things like, "Oh, you're not getting any younger. It's about time you get started," or, or um, you know, "Oh, your your baby needs a little brother or sister." Even though you may have gone through you know terrible struggles with your fertility, um, and they have no idea. But um, or even if they do know, a lot of times your parents know, and they either have comments about how you should be spending your money and you should be investing it, not wasting it on fertility care. Um, you really need some retirement money or, you know, a, a parent may say something hurtful about the way that you're proceeding with your fertility care. So I um, encourage my patients to have that conversation with their partner about how much we're going to share with others um, and really respecting that. And sometimes it's, it's, hard to avoid, especially if you have to, for instance, notify work mm -hmm. that you're not going to be, you know, present because of some fertility, fertility procedure or appointments and that kind of kinds of things. But you could use other ways of explaining that rather than getting people all involved into your, um, your fertility care. But, um, but also just managing, um, talking with your partner about how to manage family and friends that might become intrusive and really just you know, holding tight in that couple bubble and we're going to protect this um, and, you know, protect each other and, and you're just pr politely declining any questions yeah. that, that people ask you um, right. at or an appropriate time. Say, them I, being I, yeah, or you can say, you know what, I just am so in love with my jade egg right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. We'll probably don't say that. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah, got a lot, we, of a lot of times we feel like we're being rude by declining questions, but the question itself is rude. So right. just remind yourself of that, that, that your fertility is nobody's business, but yours and your partner. And if somebody's rude enough to ask you a question about it, you can politely say, you know, we don't talk about those sorts of things and just let it go. And, right. you know, or that, deflect it. Like, did you yeah. did you see Dr. Amy and Dr. Renee on the last Egg Whisper show? <laughs> you exactly. Watch that show. <laughs> so we got a lot of questions from last week's show, and one of them was about how we talked a little bit about. You said something about how I think like thirty percent. What was the statistic on how much sex people have in the U.S.? Yeah. So the statistics I've read is that that twenty to thirty percent of people are in sexless or nearly sexless uh, relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, having sex less than 10 times per year. Um, so, mm-hmm. so it's a lot of people. And that's been my experience as a, as a practitioner that that's one of the concerns that a lot of my mm-hmm. patients have, even younger patients, you yeah. know, we, we somehow, um, think of that as people get older, that, that sex becomes less frequent, but I've had people in their twenties, thirties that, that rarely have sex either because of discomfort because of, um, you know, just not having much desire. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can help them to cultivate more desire using, Mm -hmm. um, you know, some holistic practices that I, that I teach them. Mm -hmm. And then how much is enough though? Like what would then be considered a healthy sex life? Yeah, it really depends on, on the individual. So whatever a person decides is enough for them. There's a lot of times mismatch in relationships though. And that can cause a lot of, of, of turmoil in the relationship. That's one of the more common um, relationship struggles that people have is that one partner has a higher sex drive than the other one. And just learning how to, um, you know, develop outlets for the, the higher sex drive partner that they can use to, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, be able to manage their, their sex uh, desi- sexual desire being high, and then also helping to support the partner with the lower sex drive to increase their sex drive. Okay. And then a lot of communication, you know, so many people, they know more about their partner's food preferences, like I have on my website, food yeah. preferences and sexual preferences. But there are ways that you could develop uh, um, support around the person with the lower sex drive to try to turn up their um, sexual cues, you know, um, in in figure out what's going on with them that why they're they're blocked as far as their sexual energy goes mm-hmm. um you know it may be that they're uh, they have aversions to sex because of either religious messaging or you know sexual trauma in the past or some mm-hmm. other issue um and so learning how to how to heal that yeah and i imagine you see a lot of couples that might be on the brink of divorce over this issue for sure yeah a lot of people even if they don't divorce they contemplate leaving a relationship or or um infidelity over this matter, and um, and and sometimes that actually can be the answer for a couple, and, and that's up to a couple to decide. If the person with the higher sex drive, um, you know, communicates with their partner, and they come up with a solution that maybe we have another person involved, which is not a popular idea, but but it can be, um, mm-hmm. you know, something that that can be um, agreed upon in a couple, but it doesn't have to be. But we can, you know negotiate those kind of things in my coaching. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult dis- discussion to have alone, right. so it helps to have an expert kind of, you know, helping people through those kind of hurdles. Right, so you're, I was gonna say, you, I specialize in creative family building and you, you specialize in creative sexy life building. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so and, if you were and, in and, charge, yeah. if you were yeah. like the America's uh, let's say, equivalent of the Surgeon General, but in charge of sexual health, what would you do to make America sexy again? <laughs> yeah, so um, one of the things I would do is just to normalize a lot of these issues that people go through. Many people think that they're struggling alone when they have sexual issues, but almost all of us have some some issue with sexuality or another. Um, you know, many of us who are serious-minded, um, you know, have a hard time surrendering you know, dropping into our body, you know, quieting our mind and feeling into our, our sexuality and to, into our sensations. Um, other people, you know, especially as we age, you know, um, struggle with issues like health issues and, and sexuality. Um, and, you know, one partner may have a lot of a lot of health issues, the other one doesn't. What happens with the person that's that's healthier? 
um, as the other one is not able to have sex, sex the way that they want to. So, um, you know, those kind of issues do come up and nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but, um, but, you know, I think it's, it's time, you know, we're, we're so open about so many things, you know, people talk about their bowel habits in public. So time to start talking about sexuality and, and getting people the help that they need, not having them struggle alone. Right. But not many doctors are really comfortable talking about these things the way you are. Yeah. Yeah. I've even heard from, from many of my, my clients that they've been to, to, uh, psychotherapists or talk, talk to their gynecologist or your your urologist about their issues. And they got a little, you know, laugh or, um, you know, got dismissed because the doctor wasn't comfortable talking about these issues. Um, and, and that can be even more wounding to a person who's already struggling with these kind of things. Mm -hmm. so. And then how do you do your consults? Are you available over telemedicine platforms? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I generally will do my um, my consultation um, over video conference, over Zoom. Um, and then um, my, my coaching sessions are, are also done over the video conference. I have an office in Walnut Creek, so if it's more convenient for patients to meet in person um, and they're local in the area, I can meet them in Walnut Creek in my office. Mm -hmm. And talking about the couple bubble, you don't just meet with individuals, but you also meet with couples as well? That's right, yeah. So, um, so I would say most of my clients are one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we can heal a lot of issues within relationships, even just talking to one individual. So a lot of people worry, oh, my partner's not on board with this coaching thing, and I don't know if I can get them in the office. Um, they really don't have to, to be involved. I can teach tools that will help you communicate better with your partner and kind of draw them into this, but also just healing, you know, individual issues that are going on with you. Mm -hmm. um, but also I can work with couples in um, developing better communication tools and relating better sexually, give them sexual practices they can do. There's not, there's no clothes off in my, in my coaching. So no um, clothes off. I'm sorry, <laughs> people have to keep their pants on, but I can train them what to do for homework um, to help with their sexual. Got it. So you talk a lot about tools. And what I missed was you never said the word prescriptions. And so I think when people think about seeing a doctor, you know, they just come in, they're like, okay, just give me a prescription for Cialis, Viagra, for a woman, maybe Valium. And of course, there's some newer medications for women to try for sexual dysfunction. Um, do you prescribe those as well in your practice? Yeah, I, I, I use those in a very limited fashion. So, um, you know, sometimes I'll use vaginal um, estrogen uh, therapy and that kind of thing. Um, but I've learned that these holistic tools like breath work, focus, moving energy through the body, sounding, all these other things can really help to awaken sexual desire in ways that medications really haven't been shown to do. You know, there's a lot of failures with those medications um, because sometimes the issue really isn't a blood flow issue, which is what Viagra addresses, or, you know, it's not a, it's not necessarily a hormonal issue. A lot of it is a psychological deep um, imprinting in our nervous system that got wired around, you know, sex is dirty, sex is shameful, you know, people like me shouldn't be having sex, or, you know, like serious minded people. Um, and there's a lot of tension in the pelvic floor that a lot of people carry with them. Those kinds of things can't be helped with the medication. Those mm -hmm. things really need um, more holistic tools. I think of, of the, the way that I train people, it's more like yoga for your sexuality, mm -hmm. or it's, it's like a personal trainer type of thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily something that needs to be medicated, but just a, a different way of approaching mm -hmm. your sexuality that makes it more pleasurable, makes um, your desire go up, um, and, and just makes you more relaxed and, and happier overall. Mm -hmm. And what does some what from start to finish with your twelve week seriously sexy program? What should someone expect to get, you know, from the start to finish? Yeah, well, it's really individualized. So, so I in, individualize all my therapy. I have a huge tool chest of different things that can help people. But the the first call is is generally getting really clear on what you want, what your desire is, as far as working with me, um, and then um, we'll go into what kinds of blockages there might be in you not having your desires. You know, if you didn't have any blockages, you would have your desire. So what is it that's stopping you from getting what you want? And then um, looking into those blockages one by one to see how we can unwind them, you know, updating your beliefs to more useful beliefs that can help you get 
you know, the kind of relationship or the kind of sexual um, life that you want. Mm -hmm. um, and then really wiring into your nervous system, into the deep subconscious and unconscious in your brain, things that may be impeding you from getting what you want. Um, and then, you know, just other nourishing practices that help to boost um, sexual energy, things like breast massage, testicular massage, um, you know, vulvar massage can actually help to awaken sexual energy and, and move energy through the body in ways that, that, you know, have been known for thousands of years in, in Eastern traditions, but mm -hmm. are very new to our culture. Um, so well, especially when everyone has a cell phone in one hand <laughs> and a laptop in the other. Right. It's exactly. hard to, you know, yeah. let go of those things. Yeah, so you're going to have to make a choice, put one of those down and <laughs> get in your pants. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I love how comfortable you are talking about these things because I honestly don't talk like this to my patients. I mean, I just basically give them a prescription of when to have sex. Yeah. So I think it's great that you're local to me and I'm definitely going to send my patients to you so they can learn more. I help with patients who have blocked fallopian tubes and I deal with those kinds of blockages, but it's nice to know that we have you to help with the sexual blockages and I imagine that having patients get through sexual challenges can be extremely impactful for their overall life you know forever for them yeah yeah it's been really really meaningful to me just being able to help people in this way I've had people just running around with you know just enormous amounts of anxiety around their sexuality and nobody to share it with even not comfortable sharing that with their partners and, you know, a lot of times the partner blames themselves because they think it has something to do with them or that the person doesn't desire them enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've had people well into their 60s and their late 60s who have never had pleasurable sex lives. And I've trained them to, you know, be able to connect to their sexuality, to be able to relax and surrender, communicate better with their partners so they're getting the things they want. Um, insects and and just really changing it. You know, they they many times thought that their sex life is just over. Like you know, there's something that just never was for me. But mm -hmm. then they can really learn to you know enjoy that part of their life, and and that's been really special for me. Great, great. Well, you sang a cover song with cool lyrics last week, and I don't expect you on the spot to sing us. You know, let's talk about sex, baby. But maybe one day we'll get Salt and Peppa out here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and maybe we can sing. And for those of you, some people ask me why you've seen my vagina before. And obviously, you're also an OBGYN delivering babies for 18 years. And you also delivered mine as well. Yeah, that's probably the wrong time to lick my lips, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just saw that. Yes. <laughs> I'm so honored that you chose me to take care of you during your pregnancy. <laughs> thank you, Renee. Well, thank you yeah. for being on tonight's show, part two of Sex, Love, and Relationships. You can catch Dr. Renee Hilliard uh, on last week's show. Please be sure to find it on our YouTube channel if you're just tuning in for part two. You can also go to her website, ReneeHilliard.com, put in your information into her contact form with the code Egg Whisper, and she'll send you a fertility meditation that she's created just for our viewers here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Renee. Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Amy. We'll Such see you a pleasure. Soon. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert Dr. Amy Vazadeh, and you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 